Greetings. Today we'll take a look at this new acquisition of mine, the French Medieval Falchion by Angus Trim. So Angus Trim is a legendary figure in the sword community. You can look up the internet and you will find posts going back decades from now uh, with Angus Trim uh, discussing matters related to swords with uh, known figures today in the Hema community. He has decades of experience making swords. In addition, Angus Trim is one of the early adopters of the theory of harmonic balance in historical swords, uh, along with Peter Johnson and Michael Tinker Pierce and others. So the series goes historical swords all demonstrate a phenomenon where the sword blades gets longer, a certain degree of flexibility has to be introduced to make the sword durable upon impact, and the blade of his sword swords all demonstrate several vibration nodes. You can observe here, as the sword blade flexes, there is one spot that remained static. And if you flex the blade this way, you see the hill also vibrates, meaning the hand vibrates along the sword blade. But there is a spot that also remains static in the hilt where you hold on to the grip. The degree of the sword's flex and the time it takes for a sword blade to return to being static is an aspect needs to be fine-tuned individually by the swordsmith to achieve a scientific effect so that the sword is handle in the most optimal way, especially when you move the sword blade around and to change angles in sword fighting. You don't want the sword blade to vibrate for a long time and destabilize the cut. As you can observe here, it takes a much longer time for this sword blade to stop vibrating. So if there's any change of angle in mid of a technique, this sword is more likely to fail and cut because it's still flexing significantly when another cut lands. This gets increasingly crucial as the sword blade gets lighter and thinner when the user wants lively handling characteristics from the sword. It also reduces significantly the hand shot your hand receives from the grip when the sword makes an impact. Punching and, and make range swords typically cannot afford to be tinkered and tuned individually as they have to minimize the cost. Each of these specimens made by Enstream is fine-tuned individually, which is the reason why many of his work are used in cutting competitions and tournaments. So obviously he can count as one of the grandmasters of modern reproduction of medieval swords. Uh, he is mostly focused in a source from the 12th century to the 15th century, so high to late medieval age source. He makes mostly double edged, single handed arming swords and long swords, uh, and some single edged swords like this medieval falchion as well. So, this particular specimen is an Elmsley F3E falchion. And Elmsley typology is one of the latest ones to be introduced along with Pedersen typology which focuses on Viking Age swords and axes and spears and the well-known Oakshaw typology which focuses on primarily medieval double-edged swords. So James Elmsley is a famous specialist in recreating medieval single-edged swords such as falchions and Messers. According to Elmsley's research, falchions have been mystified and misinterpreted as a brutish lower class weapon, which is um, a misconception from the uh, very typical Type 1 falchions that has the image of a meat cleaver and machete on a sword hilt. They are actually not brutish like weapons, but instead 
slicers with a very delicate edge. Even though sometimes they feature a very broad edge, uh, they are generally very slim, well-crafted weapon with lively handling characteristics. The Type 3 falchion typifies uh, late medieval ones with flip points. Type 3E is an umbrella subtype that includes all the falchions with a relatively slender profile and multiple clip points. They usually feature a straight cross guard over here and a wheel pommel. You can pair Angus Trim Sword with other high end reproductions, such as uh, an Albion Sword. You find out that Angus Trim, being one of the people that proposes harmonic balance, he really enjoys making a lively feeding source like this one. And this has a lot to do with the mass distribution of the sword blade, the tapering strategy, both in the profile and distilling. Also, don't forget the 10 is connected to the blade, so the dimension of the 10 also matters a lot. It is critically important for the maker to tinker this aspect individually to achieve the harmonic balance in the sword blade. The mounting quality of the hilt construction also matters a lot. And on top of that, everything has to work in concert with the spring tempering of the blade. Trust me, that's no small feat. And we're about to see the impact it has on the performance of cutting. see that despite feeling relatively simple with this uh, blade profile at a distance, it actually features a lot of complexity in its blade. Starting from this blade profile, as I mentioned earlier, it's a relatively slender type of function compared to some of the early functions. So the width started at uh, slightly over 4 centimeters at the base and it remains so until the first clip point and it becomes narrower between the first clip point and the second one and once again it broadens between the second clip point and the third one and incidentally this is the broadest point of the entire blade and it comes with a acute point with the last clip point granted that the entire blade remains relatively broad and features a single bevel from the spine to the edge. But how about the distal taper? And we know that distal taper um, means a lot to the handling of swords. And of course, this being made by Angus Trim, and he is definitely going to use his judgment of uh, creating lively swords by making a very unique 
distally tapered blade, and its base is measured at a whopping 6.4 millimeters. That's very thick for a, a single handed sword. And it tapers very aggressively to the second flip point over here, down to a little bit more than two millimeters. And it remains so for the remainder 40% uh, of the blade until the tip. So for the last two clip points, the blade remains very thin. And you can definitely see the effect of this if I flex the blade. Very, very springy, flexible, especially for the um, last one third of the blade. So this means that even near the tip, it remains a very effective slicer. Don't think of it as a chopper because of the lightweight, the entire sword weighs a little bit above two pounds. And given its length, 31 inch blade and 38 inch overall length, that's extremely light. For comparison, I just received this Albion Prince, an oak shot type 16 army sword. It features this strongly tapered blade, both in the profile and in the distal taper, and indeed, it handles extremely well. But it just simply cannot compare to this falchion, and you see that it's almost six ounces heavier than this Angostrian falchion, despite having a similar blade length. And from the profile, uh, you have the illusion that they actually feature less steel. But due to this unique extreme distal taper, this features uh, a blade that's extremely live and they just want to move. The moment you pick this up, it feels different. Anecdotally, on the same day, I happened to receive Tom Dynasty Chinese Dao in a hand and half portion from LK Chen. And that's indeed a very lively feeding sword. I really enjoy cutting with it as well as doing all the drills. But when you pick up this Angus Trin Falchion, you instantly feel the difference. When you hold on to it, there's no stress in your hand at all. And when you change the stance, it's all very natural. And they just want to flow, it wants to move, it wants to cut as if it has taken on its own life, it has its own will. I understand this sounds uh, very exaggerated, but ask any HEMA practitioner that has handled an Angus Trim blade, and they will tell you, is this historical? It's difficult to say. Well, this kind of propulsion are relatively rare, and you find one example with almost the identical blade profile at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And that's an Italian example. So why does Endestream call this a French falchion? If you look at a 15th century French translation of the Mirror of History, Speculum Historial, which was originally written in Latin in the 13th century, the 15th century French manuscript features a lot of falchions, many of this type. So we can probably infer from the artistic interpretation that well, during that time period, in the mid to late 15th century, this type of slender functions with a clip point is exceedingly popular with uh, French nobility and their retainers. So this instantly depunked the misconception that functions are lower class weapons. Uh, if anything, they are the complete opposite. They are a high status weapon. So what distinguished functions? from Messers, another very popular single-edged sword. The difference between Messers and Falchions is all in the hilt. Blade pure Falchions share the same blade types as Messers, but Falchions feature sword hilts, usually with a straight cross. Uh, Renaissance period Falchions sometimes have more intricate sword guards with knuckle bows and so on. Messers usually have a knuckle guard and occasionally a small shell guard. The falchion grips are identical to arming swords, with leather wrapping uh, on top of wooden cores, while the messers usually just have a wooden grip, sometimes with grooves on them. The majority of falchions feature wheel pommels, while the messers either have an asymmetric 
steel pommel or have no pommel at all. Why is that? People say the knife makers were trying to circumvent sword makers' skews regulations and get into the lucrative sword markets of the 15th and 16th century. You also see some two-handed version as well, but they are primarily used as a single-handed weapon, most of the time with either a shield or a buckler. So they can be used as sidearms in war, or indeed um, for civilian carry. Um, in self-defense situations, sword and buckler happens to be one of the favorite fighting styles of Angus Trim. And when you pick up this falchion, then you can see why that is. Why he decided to make a sword uh, of this size and characteristics. Uh, if you pair it with a small buckler, it just goes around the buckler with all these stabbing and snap cuttings really well. It's quite a deadly pair. However, given the uh, extreme thinness for the last one third of this blade, I can guess that this is probably uh, primarily used for light cutting, really quick slash to uh, cause deliberating blows to your opponents, rather than a heavy cleaver that removes a thigh or cleave a person in half. One drawback of the fine geometry of this edge is it's very delicate. It's not suitable for a heavy duty cutting, uh, throwing uh, big wild cleaving cuts that uh, shearing through bones. It might damage the fine edge, uh, make it deform uh, or chip indeed because there's not a lot of material near the edge. You can refer to Angus Trim's essay on swords being consumables. You should never consider swords as eternal possessions, as they definitely degrade over time. Um, the grip and the hilt components uh, might come apart, and the blade, if maintained uh, properly, can last a long time uh, until you cut with it. Eventually, it will uh, wear down the edge, and you have to repolish or sharpen it. So if you want a very efficient edge, never expect it to last for a long time. Well, your technique can improve the durability of your sword. Try to throw uh, less cuts with poor edge alignment, but it will degrade for sure. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the fit and finish of the sword. Along the blade, I can see some minor rippling, even though the flat round of this uh, edge geometry is extremely well done. If you run your finger across the blade, you will not feel the rippling. And it has this um, slightly rough satin finish. So if you compare the polish with an Albion sword, you see that it's more uneven. However, given the reputation of Angus Trim swords as practitioner swords, for cutting, you can probably say that it, it would not really matter that much. Because of the single bevel from the spine to the edge, it will be extremely proficient at cutting. However, it will not be the most durable blade because of the uh, lack of apple seed geometry. It only comes down to a micro bevel, roughly half a millimeter wide. And you can just see that under the right lighting. So it has a very sharp edge that will bite onto anything. The last clip point of the blade features a false edge, even though it's not sharpened. Given the edge geometry, it shouldn't be very hard to really sharpen this for any uh, sword held motion of cutting. The blade also features a narrow and shallow fuller on both sides. It doesn't go into the tan, and the stars right here above the recussal area. On the edge side of the blade, it features a very thick recussal, relatively thick, and runs about five inches down the blade, and it goes down uh, to a cutting edge. The recussal here enables a finger grip of this function here. The blade is perfectly straight, 
uh, balsa spine at the edge, uh, given it's uh, masterly crafted by Angus Trim from 5160 spring steel, and heat treated at a aerospace grade heat treater, the Pacific Metallurgical. So let's move on to the hilt with the typical Angus Trim spike cross guard, uh, Oak Shock Type 1 cross, and a Type I wheel pummel. It's very simple. They're both heat proof to prevent corrosions uh, for practitioners' use, which I really enjoy. As you handle many of the uh, high-end swords, you're really hesitant to hold on the sword as you should after handling them by a sun grip or index finger on the Mikasa or grabbing the pommel is difficult to clean them up, especially when the geometry of the pommel and the guards gets complex. On atrium swords, it's never an issue because of the heat bluing. Most of Angus Trim's sword fittings are relatively simple in design. You can choose slightly fancier ones from him, or commission a constant build from another smith with atrium blades. But since each of these swords are fine-tuned personally by the master himself to his liking in terms of handling, Personally, I wouldn't prefer altering them. The cross guard has a universal slot to receive the blade, so it doesn't have the look of an Albion constant tight fit at the joint of the cross and the blade. But in terms of structure, you can see the slot on atrium swords have a recess, and the actual joining of the blade and the guard is without any gap in reality. So in terms of functionality, it's equivalent to an Albion or any other high-end sword. So the structural integrity is rather sound and secure. The ring tone the blade makes when you knock on it or cut with it is it's harmonically balanced and the tan is perfectly fit into the entire hilt. There is no play, no rattle, no movement and wouldn't loose up after years of use. More importantly, the hand shock feedback is rather minimal when you cut with it. The cross guard is fitted perfectly in line with the blade, the orientation, and it's grounding away to be very symmetrical on both planes. And you can see the pommel is not pinned onto the tan, but rather fixed with a hex nut. But ground down to resemble a pin block aesthetically. Another extremely good aspect of this sword is its grip. It looks rather simple, very typical for high-end swords of this caliber. Um, but if you hold on to it, it, it just it just feels right. The thickness, the circumference of the grip, it, it feels as if it's tailor-made for my hand. It has a geometry that's flat on both sides, so you get a good feel of the edge alignment. Overall, the grip is done in a very ergonomic way, and you can see it's, it tapers distally. It swells in the middle, and this grip is done by Angus Trim and with Eric, the gripsmith, to do the leather wrapping. Very tight, aesthetically pleasing. The leather wrapping ends over here. Can feel it. Wrap in one direction uh, above the cotton cord and then counter wrap again. Uh, similar to the grips on Albion source. So it looks rather nice, but feels even better. Two risers, uh, one near the pummel, one close to the cross guard, um, feels really nice. The cotton cord wrapping under the leather provides enough traction to the hand, but not aggressive at all. The transition to the cross guard is perfectly flush. The only real drawback I can think of on this sword is these ledges on the cross guard. It's a little bit sharp. I would like them to be further rounded off, send it. So there's no discomfort when you handle the sword, your index finger press against the guard and there's some feedback into the grip and your finger will suffer. Or if you hold it with your finger on the blade and you can also feel some discomfort. Over here, it's pretty sharp. Overall, the grip is very ergonomically done. I'm extremely happy with this handling. It carries a lot of authority in cuts, and when you swing it, you can feel it, the inertia. But it's really easy to stop, so if you don't want to overcommit, there's 
no problem at all. Uh, it's indeed a sword for fencing with complex techniques rather than a brutal chopper for uh, common infantry soldiers. It traps beautifully when the blade falls through the air and it's really easy to align the edge given the geometry of this grip and the slight curvature at the end of this blade. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about my experience uh, acquiring this sword. So there was one being sold at Casa last summer. I tried to pick it up, but somehow uh, their shipping cost nearly half of the sword. So I vented my anger and frustration uh, on Sword Buyers Group's Facebook page, and many of the people uh, in the group encouraged me to contact Angus Trim directly. And I thought, right, I should do that, yeah. And to my surprise, uh, Gus himself contacted me and explained about the, the shipping cost issue. And by the way, uh, the shipping cost issue got resolved with Colossina later on uh, with a few exchanges. And they asked me to do, fill a custom form for shipping costs. So kudos to Colossina as well. But Gus contacted me directly to offer several options of medieval function for me to choose from. And uh, he also posted pictures and characterized each source handling in detail. So that's extremely cool of him. Right now, the business end of the source uh, is handled by Longship Armory. So I want to thank James Town and John Longdemo for processing the source for me. Hopefully I'll uh, come to acquire some of Longship Armory's high-end source in the future. It was a hell of an experience commissioning directly from Gus himself. Uh, at the time, he stated this will take roughly four months to finish. And in reality, it only took a little bit longer than three months. I really have to respect that uh, a maker who made good on his promises. And I get to choose uh, the grip color as well as French blue. Uh, you can order directly from Gus on his Facebook page, or you can go to Longship Armory uh, or H. of Chivalry, sometimes called the Sina, to buy uh, Angus Trim's sword in stock. Highly recommended as performance-oriented practitioner's pieces. So how does this industry function fare in cutting test? It handles like a dream and it cuts like a light saber. I didn't feel any resistance at all when passing targets. It's very flat and long level, it's short. It's always a clean cut when the edge is aligned and it's very easy uh, to do edge alignment. I'm very happy for this acquisition myself, and I highly recommend this piece to any practitioners of sword buckler and single stick forms and principles.